not working. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why the video is not working. We could just chat, I guess. <laughs> oh, okay. So how's the, how's the weather today in Kyoto? Beautiful, sunny. I think it will go up to, I don't know, 18 or something like that. So it's um, a blessing. Nice. Are you seeing any of the cherry blossoms yet? Uh, yes, yep. some early ones. But I mean, the plums, of course, yeah. uh, you know, the ume and, and apricot and so on, they are in either full bloom or already a little bit over it. So, um, yeah, yeah, that's quite... I think in some ways I prefer the ume for some reason. The the nope. colors are more vibrant and it seems to last longer. The sakura cherry blossom so fleeting. If you yeah. have a strong wind or a strong rainy day, it's gone, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, and then ume I think is so much more delicate also. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, mm. my yeah. favorite too. By yeah. far, by oh, far. Nice. All right. Yeah. I think we're ready to start. Thank you so much for joining Bern and Mitsui once again. Uh, we you. had a wonderful discussion with you, Bern, the first time talking about your shojin yori making Mitsui. We had a wonderful talk with you about your mixang photography. So please refer back. Anybody watching, if you want to watch those, this time we're talking about your amazing collaborative passion project that you've been doing for about five years now has it been well uh, five years was maybe when i started thinking about it but um, that we actually started mm -hmm. is now a bit over two years ago um, and so we do this uh, together and uh, started basically with uh, so it's 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 um thought of as a long-term project mm -hmm. and uh, with not really a specific uh, deadline, in fact. Um, and we are now sort of in the middle of the first um, part, which is gathering information. So that's why it's a series of interviews. We uh, started two years ago with uh, first people I studied under here in Kyoto mostly. And then uh, we extended to other the um, chefs and, and people involved with traditional um, foods uh, of various kinds here in Kyoto mostly. And then we extended actually to um, sort of uh, related crafts and, and artisans uh, like uh, in Kyoto, of course, tofu making, for example, mm -hmm. uh, tsukimono, uh, you know, the pickling, uh, wonderful pickling techniques. And also farmers who um, especially uh, were focused on either traditional and older types of uh, vegetables um, and in a perfect situation even also uh, went or always were um, organic uh, farming techniques. And uh, we plan to continue for another probably couple of years, I guess, um, mm -hmm until we feel uh, there's uh, enough uh, material uh, and then uh, we'll decide what sort of uh, form and shape it may take. Uh, mm -hmm. Might be a film sort of thing or a book, but uh, you know, the idea is a documentary about um, Shojin as sort of an anchor point, but not solely, uh, but uh, to really uh, try to um, put a spotlight on the fabulous uh, deep traditions uh, which are relevant for all uh, food-related uh, cultures in Japan and uh, to maybe uh, that way take uh, be a little bit a small part in helping that this fabulous tradition is not uh, disappearing, which it is in danger, unfortunately. So it's an attempt to work against uh, that. Um, can you give us a little bit of your background for people who haven't seen the videos about you guys? Uh, just introduce yourselves a little bit. Um, you're deeply involved with Shojin Yori and your photography. How long have you been doing it? How did you get started with that? Just a few minutes, Takim, before we dive into this project. Why, why don't you okay. start? <laughs> okay, so I'll, I'll start first. So, um, I have been doing a, a photography has been uh, my passion and then um, but I 
didn't take a picture of uh, you know the food um, until I met Ben. So uh, Ben being um, such a you know passionate um, you know um, cook and also he studies you know um, shows in Ryori. So it got me started to uh, take a photograph more of the food, and then um, but. Uh, at the same time, you know, um, I was uh, always interested in uh, taking a picture of uh, people, a portrait. So when we met, he shared about, you know, his passion to um, interview people, um, you know, for the further study of uh, shojin ryori. So because I love uh, the food and the meeting people. So um, we started to jump on, you know, um, taking, a, um, I mean, it's mainly, it's a video. It's a video um, that we have been doing. So that's a slightly stretch from my um, familiar format, you know, of photography. But uh, we have been uh, meeting and then um, videotaping at this point, um, but when we interview people. And... For me, I, I just fiddled around to have the phone here that we see also what you show on the screen. Um, sorry about that. But yeah, my background is I came to Japan now a little bit over 30 years ago and um, studied uh, first traditional ceramics in two workshops uh, here in, uh, in Japan under two masters. And, um, and the end towards the end, of that chapter, which lasted uh, close to five years, I was lucky enough to be allowed into a uh, kitchen uh, of uh, an extraordinary, uh, delicious uh, food tradition uh, in uh, in a yado in Kyushu, in the volcanic mountains of Kyushu, next to Beppo in Ukraine, and that was for me the initiation, really, to um, sort of that that high and deep culture of cooking and uh, yeah and uh, I basically uh, started there but then um, about 10 years or maybe eight years ago or so uh, when I came back to Japan regularly again I um, studied under various uh, master chefs here in Kyoto and shojin became to me uh, especially interesting because uh, it's just so delicious but also, uh, I do think uh, that it's, uh, to a large part, really the foundation of all Japanese food uh, traditions in, in many uh, ways, more directly or indirectly, uh, depending. But um, I think the thinking process and the uh, philosophical foundations behind um, is, is in all, for all Bashoku traditions uh, very much related to, to Shojin, I think. So that's what made it so interesting to me. But um, initially, really, it was the delicious of the food which hooked me. And that's still the case. And uh, yeah, and uh, luckily, Mitsu is also very much into um, food and eating, enjoys it very mm -hmm. much. Yeah. Uh, and in, in that way also is a great inspiration, really, uh, for me, and a reason <laughs> to cook every day, um, because, uh, you know, enjoying food together is uh, is a big part of how, how del delicate it is or it tastes. So, yeah. Wonderful. We have a, a comment from Sarah Hodge on Facebook. Sarah says, I see my teacher, Mari Fuji. I have studied Shojin Yori for the last decade with numerous instructors. I also assisted with a recent certification course online for international teachers of Shiojin Yori. And this is a topic near and dear to my heart. Good evening from Texas. Thanks, Sarah. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. <laughs> Hi. Yeah. And also, um, yeah, that um, Beant um, was doing uh, um, some e event, you know, for even before um, I met him in Berlin, in Germany. So uh, he invited uh, Mari Fuji um, Sensei um, to come over and then um, uh, do the event together. So yeah, she was in Berlin a few times, right? Three and times, three I times. think. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and we we had uh, very interesting collaboration projects and. Uh, 
yeah. cooked uh, for private, semi-private settings, but also at the uh, Japanese embassy in, in Berlin, which was uh, mm. sort of a highlight. And uh, and we had her also uh, yeah. pretty much in the beginning um, for the interview series, maybe yeah, the first close, close to two oh, years ago. Right, I right. Think it was. Second person yeah. interview. Yeah. And when we are in Kamakura, where she's based, um, then uh, we often meet her and, yeah. That's great. Um, I'm showing her photo now that, that you sent to me. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit about how you choose who to invest? Because each person that you choose is such an investment in time and energy. Uh, you're documenting by video, photography, audio as well. You're just collecting. It sounds like you're just collecting all this wonderful information with a focus on not only learning for yourself, but hopefully putting it into a book or documentary film where you're not quite sure about how to use it. But can you talk a little bit about the process? Yeah, um, yeah. as I said before, the um, when studying under these various uh, masters in, in, in the kitchens here in, in Kyoto, um, it became pretty quickly clear that a lot of but not all, but a lot of uh, them are uh, pretty advanced in age, uh, as it's the case for so many uh, traditional mm -hmm. arts and crafts here in Japan. And, uh, you know, as, uh, especially for Shojin, it's not uh, such a large number of people to begin with uh, who follow this tradition in an authentic way. And uh, so uh, the, the thought naturally um, occurred, uh, can one do something to um, you know, to to document and to to uh, gather these wells of information each of these great uh, master chefs have, uh, so that it can uh, inspirational for future generations. Um, so that was basically the starting point. And yeah, what we are doing now is with these interviews is really, as you said, gathering information. Um, and how do we choose? Well, um, we started with uh, a number of the people I had the honor and pleasure to uh, study with uh, over the last years. And luckily, um, this is a little bit uh, one of the small plus sides of this Corona situation, because um, mm -hmm. some of them and also other chefs we interviewed later on normally under normal conditions would not have the time to spend to you know, give people like us for interviewing them mm. uh, but now yes it's possible so we were very very lucky to um uh, to to also approach uh, people we didn't know that well but uh, respected mm. their art i mean pretty famous people also and they were open and had the time to uh, for the interviews, uh, which was uh, a blessing. And that kind of keeps on going. Mm. And um, also, sort of one leads to the other, as you probably also have experience with your fabulous uh, series of these uh, sustainable uh, or seeking sustainability interview series. So, uh, so we also sometimes ask people who we respect and who understand what we are doing um, if they have a, you know, a, a hint or can introduce us to someone uh, interesting with, you know, interesting thoughts, interesting uh, approach to his or her cooking. So that's how it kind of continues in a uh, sort of a natural growing way somehow. Yeah, wonderful. Um, you mentioned that you're not sticking strictly to shojin yori related chefs or cooking, that you're also doing uh, ryokan style, high-end kyo kaiseki, traditional cha kaiseki. So can you talk about the different themes? So not only shojin yori, um, maybe we should explain shojin yori to start with. So what okay. is shojin yori? Uh, what is Kyo Kaiseki. So what are the different topics and, and explain them a little bit? That'd be great. Yeah. Well, Shojin, um, it, it, in, in a narrow sense, it's the um, 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 cuisine developed uh, through uh, or with the backbone of Zen Buddhism. 
So originally it was uh, a cuisine for the monastery and temple uh, set inside uh, the monastery and temple settings, and it um, came in with uh, Zen Buddhism from China uh, via Korea. Uh, in, in, in the Zen Buddhist case, uh, 12th, 13th century, and then onwards in waves it developed um, and uh, got refined here. So. Uh, when one talks about Shoujin in a narrow sense, and often what's meant is basically what developed, um, well, to roughly to the form we have now in the 15th, 16th century in Japan. But it's an ongoing, was an ongoing process. But of course, uh, uh, the roots are going deeper and far, far further back in history. Um, not only in China uh, were, uh, were it developed over the centuries, but, you know, back as Buddhism uh, to India. And although it's more and more difficult as further you go back to track uh, concrete influences, but surely there will be Indian, uh, you know, the great vegetarian, vegan food traditions of India, Ayurvedic traditions, for example, um, had surely their impact uh, in developing this uh, cuisine. And then, uh, as said, when it uh, traveled through uh, China and uh, Southeast Asia in general, um, picked up influences uh, like the five element teachings of uh, Chinese uh, or Taoist teachings, the understanding that food is medicine and medicine is food and so on. So it, it came it came in um, with all these uh, deep roots into history to Japan and was then uh, very much um, refined in Japan, also in various traditions. So various Zen Buddhist schools have different types of, of Shojin, but they all are based uh, on the same principles uh, in, in on uh, Zen Buddhist teaching, basically. So that's uh, so that's uh, to show him. Um, what came further, Kaisiki, which is uh, the refined uh, cuisine um, um, developed in in uh, you know in the highest part of society, uh, in the court and for noblemen, um, and which is today uh, served in you know high end restaurants, uh, Kyoto being the center of that. Um, that's very much based also on, um, on Shoujin thinking. And when I say that, uh, of course, the difference, uh, one of the key differences is that it's not vegan or vegetarian, but, um, uh, you know, of course, seafood uh, uh, these days, but also increasingly uh, meat, various meat uh, dishes are you know, a major part of, of um, Kaiseki, but it's a relatively recent development because, as I said, Kyoto is, and to some degree, or was, and to some degree, still is the center uh, for uh, these tra traditional culinary um, schools. Um, that's you know l relatively far off the sea, so uh, seafood plays a role, but not such a major role, uh, especially. Uh, in, in the past. So that's a very recent uh, development that uh, things like sashimi or so uh, became a central part of, uh, of kaiseki or chakaiseki, which chakaiseki, to make that difference too, um, is related to the uh, tea um, culture. Um, so that uh, is a form of uh, a very, very refined uh, menu uh, developed towards, so with, which is served in a, in a ceremonial setting, um, towards tea. So tea is a central element of it, but before you have your tea, you get a set of small but uh, extremely delicate uh, things um, uh, to, to eat a little bit. And... Um, that also adds to the tea culture in itself is very much related to Zen Buddhist thinking. So there is a very uh, almost straight line in uh, traditional connection or how these things are traditionally connected. And, uh, and I and we think that's uh, very interesting to talk to, for example, uh, master chefs of those traditions too and um, ask them what their viewpoint is towards mm -hmm. Shoujin, for example, to what degree 
they see uh, direct connections or not. So, I mean, of course, each and everyone has a different you know, opinion and viewpoint on these things, but it's hugely interesting to dive into these uh, traditions. And uh, as you said, for us, uh, the learning aspect is huge. Um, uh, because it's so complex, you know, it's just so, as further you, you dig, as more uh, passes appear, and, and it's it's hugely interesting, and uh, I think even in Japan, uh, and even for professionals in the food uh, business in Japan, uh, many aspects are just not known, or not known any longer, and that's a tendency in food as well as in many, many other traditions in, in, in Japan, the knowledge is really thinning out dramatically, I would say. So it's high time to uh, at least try to gather these uh, as much as uh, one can, and that's our attempt for this documentary project, mm -hmm. to gather this knowledge because um, it's so valuable and so inspirational also, I think. Wonderful. I'm so excited that you're making it. And I know it's so much work, but I, you know, I see um, traditional cultural Japanese heritage like these things dropping off like like you both do. And you're so invested in your career in learning it and sharing it. So it must be deeply impactful for your life and hopefully a great documentary for future generations if, God forbid, these things cease to exist in the future, you know, like it just becomes work from factories. One thing that really stuck out in my mind, Burned, we talked about maybe doing a workshop in the future and doing a two-hour workshop for the series extension to teach people how to do shojin yori and one of the most powerful things i didn't realize is you were saying it's just impossible in two hours to teach anything <laughs> like the <laughs> amount of time you need to prepare for shojin yori and learn the philosophy you need 10 weeks of full day sessions or so i mean i'm hoping we can find some compromise but i i find this so much in many aspects of traditional japan as i'm sure you're you're finding in your series um it takes so much time and it's done with so much care and so much meaning so of course this might also be the reason it's difficult to pass on easily to the next generation. Is that what you're finding? Yeah, uh, no such thing as easily <laughs> at all. Uh, but it's, um, but that's at the same time the fascinating thing, I mean, to me anyways. Uh, it's, of course, it, it's rooted in a different uh, mindset. It's not about getting six things done quickly and uh, doing it in the most efficient and, and um, um, yeah, quick way. It's 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 really slow food. You know, it's really slow. Mm -hmm. And uh, but this slowness is uh, at its core. It's that's the appreciation, or part mm -hmm. part of it is the appreciation. And as you pointed out, the extreme care uh, to each detail. And even if one studies for years, um, that's also, you know, each master chef uh, does things differently. But for me, each and every time, what is most mind-blowing really is uh, the extreme amount of dedication these people mm -hmm. for decades put in there. And I, I remember, for example, a chef I studied under, <clears throat> um, when we interviewed him, um, I asked him something like his definition or something of uh, Kyokai Seki. And, uh, and he's, he's a very respected uh, master chef and does it for decades. And he said, you know, hard to say. I saw it at some point. I got it. A couple of years later, you start again. And that's an ongoing process so that's also you're, you're not uh, you know you're not uh, learning something or studying something 
and then you you got it and you 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 just continue doing it it's an endless studying process is you know everything zen related you know it may that be tea or or whatever poetry uh, calligraphy whatever it might be um that's i think that's very much the the idea of uh of all Zen-related practices, to see what one does is uh, as a as a path, as a ongoing and never-ending uh, path, really. Yeah. And um, it's it's and a, after all, a so kind of a kind of mindfulness, right? And mindfulness, yes, yeah, sure. That's that's I guess uh, um, even though that word is, is uh, I know maybe it's, it's overused, opinion. right? Yeah. But uh, but uh, what yeah, what Mitsui was talking about with her photography as well, and what you talk about with Shojin Yori, and what I've heard from countless other people who are trying to live their lives in a more sustainable way is even menial jobs, even the hard things. If you think about it as a luxury of time, to give yourself enough time to do things slowly, it becomes very enjoyable, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It's it's in my mind, anyways. It's and that's mm -hmm. I think uh, for Mitsui's uh, Mixang uh, approach for to photography, also. So it's mm -hmm. it's pay attention, and then the world's open up. It it doesn't almost doesn't matter what it is. Uh, you but if you. Uh, and it's a repeated teaching in, in, in Zen uh, Buddhist uh, uh, philosophy also, you know, it's, it's about to train, if, if it is about training one's mind, then it is about paying attention and with an open mind and, uh, and one, and then it's, it's really, it's, a, it's a, uh, not only endless in, in terms of, I mean, that can be overwhelming too, you know, it's, it's an endless, you know, you may want to give up perhaps, but uh, it's endlessly interesting and curious, at least to me, mm. like us. So, um, so that's, uh, that's not uh, something um, horrible or, or so. That's the actual uh, richness of it. Yeah, mm. wonderful. Um, yeah, can you, yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, um, I just wanted to add, um, yeah, because I observe, you know, um, how Beyond uh, cooks and then how the cooking is woven into um, his daily life. So, you know, um, like, I, I think um, there is certainly some uh, uh, devotional aspect to it, but that's so joyful. And then he enjoys it so much and then it doesn't, seems as it's a uh, very, um, what can I say, it's not, um, I'm always amazed, you know, how much uh, focus and attention and how much time go into it, but, you know, because it's um, blending into uh, the daily life, so that's kind of a, yeah, like you said, um, has a sustainable element to it, and then, um, I think it became a part of the the life, and then many people who whom we interview um, says a very similar thing. So the cooking or the making, uh, whatever whatever they're doing, um, became their passion, and then they it became um, uh, really it's uh, integrated to their own life. So from like. Um, outside, it almost looks like it's a, a kind of practice itself, like uh, uh, the Zen monk does in a temple. But, um, you know, they don't even realize it, you know, <laughs> it's just because it's just a kind of a um, part of their life. But mm -hmm. I, I think that certainly there is an element to it. So, yeah. The opposite extreme of, I think, a trend which is maybe changing now because of coronavirus, but wasn't there a trend for the last 20 years of people trying to do as much as possible, multitasking, uh, best use of your time, and everybody was just so exhausted all the time because they're trying to do everything all the time. And uh, this is kind of a, a counterculture idea 
mm-hmm. to slow down and appreciate even the most normal of tasks. Really enjoy every part of your day, no matter if it's a chore or making food or doing things you have to do. Change your mindset and make it something you want to do and how you want to live your life. I love mm-hmm. love the concept. Gorgeous. Yeah. yeah. That's true. If you look around, you know, like um, I, I said, you don't have to go travel um, necessarily to take uh, amazing uh, photographs. I mean, that it's everywhere in your life. And then so as if you um, pay attention to the carrot that you have in your hand and then really sort of uh, appreciate it and then cook it mindfully with that, you know, um, that will really change your um, perspective. Mm. So. You, yeah. yeah, I think Go also uh, mm-hmm. that um, the whole um, connection to food and eating and food cultures uh, in, in our, especially our uh, Western uh, modern societies um, is pretty remote, as you just described. So eating and, and, and fooding was so, uh, you know, as quick as possible, a lot of, you know, on the go and so on. Um, which puts, in my mind, quite a huge distance between something not only necessary, but uh, it's, it's our basically our most substantial relation to nature, you know, eating it, mm-hmm. <laughs> putting it into, into our mouth. And uh, if one thinks about it, food was and is for most, not only most humans, but uh, most uh, living beings, the main occupation. You know, I mean, uh, for generations, uh, you know, we we spend most of our efforts to, you know, get the food and prepare it. And I mean, it was the main activity uh, mm-hmm. for for thousands of years. Uh, and uh, now it kind of occupies a tiny side a spot for many, uh, maybe even an annoying uh, activity. And I think that's. Um, it's very much out of balance of what it could be because uh, to try to understand what eating, what food, what that is, what that means um, gives you, if you think about it, a different um, um, way of connecting to nature also and, uh, and realizing the interconnectedness of all things and so on. So I think it's, it, it's very, very, uh, valuable, especially in our times. Um, and even though I said for the, uh, you know, in, in, in the context of Western society, but in generally, I mean, as you know, in, in, in Japan, that's uh, very much true as well, because uh, so many things are about uh, convenience. Here, maybe more so than any other uh, country on earth. And um, that seems tempting, but in the end, and you know, you're serious on, on uh, sustainability, it is not, not sustainable. And uh, so we have to rethink and readjust and do things differently. And uh, that's not uh, a horrible thing. That's a very, very rewarding thing. So I think if, if one does that shift in one's mind, um, that the changes uh, which we partly be forced to do um, can also something hugely uh, enjoyable and and uh, opening is is important. I think that's uh, it, in, in terms of food uh, more obvious and uh, more quickly and immediately to experience uh, than with anything else. Because uh, if you if you eat something good, your body tells you. And then your mind is 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 uh, also responding to that in a very immediate fashion. So uh, there's no um, um, no need for argumentation of any sorts, really. So that's at, at least something what I and what we enjoy uh, a lot, and and basically also with every meal we eat. So uh, mm-hmm. so it's it's I mean the, the, that's I guess for us the. Um, um, the main purpose may be to um, maybe help people to to um, 
to just give a little hint in what direction uh, one could start searching and change uh, habits related to eating and to cooking, for example. And if that's uh, even a few people start doing that, that would be uh, fantastic. And then hopefully spread. <laughs> yeah, no, wonderful. Um, could you introduce some of the people that you've sent me portraits of, which I've been showing? Um, tell yeah. us about these wonderful people you've been interviewing. Yeah, yeah. We we uh, see a little bit on the small screen, uh, even though with a little time. Uh, I think a few seconds later than you show. <laughs> if this is still on uh, on on view, what what I see now, uh, there is. Uh, I think to to be fair, one should start with the oldest and also to me one of the most important uh, people uh, on the screen. The monk um, is Abbot, actually. I should say, um, in the upper. Uh, what is it, the right corner? The left, okay, it mm -hmm. seems to be mirrored. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, upper, upper Nishikawa, and then, yeah. oh, on both, both sides, sides actually, yeah, right, it's so yeah. small, I can see. Uh, that's, um, that's a uh, abbot who is uh, sort of a celebrity in, um, in connection to Shoujin Yori, who wrote many books and appeared in media, TV and papers and so on. Uh, Nishikawa Gembo Sensei, and uh, he was instrumental also, uh, and to very, very kind to introduce me uh, to uh, one of the most famous, uh, famous uh, Shoujin kitchens in, uh, called Ajiro in, uh, uh, in the near of uh, Myoshinji, uh, which is a temple complex. His uh, temple is also in. And um, yeah, he was actually the first interview, wasn't he? Um, yeah, I think first so. or second, I'm not sure. Plus, yeah. And um, and it was so vivid. Uh, I mean, he's also a character who likes to talk and who has things to say. One should <laughs> say, I mean, both important. And um, I think we 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 planned uh, twenty or thirty minutes or so. Yeah. Talk, and it went two hours almost. Uh, almost two hours. Yeah. Because he and he was just warming up. <laughs> I mean, it was like, yeah, and uh, and it's so interesting uh, what he has to say, and mm. and so uh, substantial mm. also. Um, it's yeah. it's quite a, quite a blessing to to know people like that, and, mm. and he was also coming over to uh, to our place here and to have uh, a meal together, which which I mm. served, and to hear his comments or even see, just see him. Um, yeah, it was quite interesting. Right. So yeah, for him, uh, I think the, um, he, of course, talk about his philosophy and his wisdom. You know, he shared his wisdom, but also, um, um, I, I think he um, he was so good to uh, put the context in the political, um, not the political, but the, in the social kind of context. So he's so aware that how we eat or how we consume things uh, is related to the social change. And he is, he's been talking about it, you know, uh, publicly, and then also he's been, I, I think, uh, thinking about it. So um, he does his, uh, actually do a little introduction of uh, uh, Shoujin cooking uh, to uh, the people too. So um, yeah, it was interesting. He has a lot to talk about. You know, he yeah. talks about the global warming and then, you know, how it's related to the, how we consume and then so on and so forth. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then he's also concerned. Um, he's uh, over 80 years old. Right? Yeah, 87 yeah, or something, yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, um, very vigorous. Uh, yeah, really interesting. Uh, we've had a comment from Molly B on Periscope. Thank you, Molly. She says, mm -hmm. becoming vegetarian has been the best thing I've done for my body. I'm working on becoming vegan. It's hard, though, because my partner doesn't want to. I think this is, <laughs> this is often a hurdle, right? And you talked about convenience before. It's so inconvenient in Japan or anywhere to try not to eat meat or try not to eat fish because that's the norm. So, yeah. you know, uh, enjoying it as an art... But actually trying to eat outside your home is often a real challenge for vegetarians yeah. and vegans, especially in Japan, right? Yeah, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then 
Yeah, and then I, I think how the um, the meat you know, industry is operating, you know, in the general, um, perhaps, you know, and then also think about how it's affecting to the environment, you know, going to vegan or vegetarian is seems to be a kind of wise, uh, considerate choice, I, I think. But I, I think um, that goes into, uh, I wanted to mention Nakahigashi-san, um, so Nakahigashi-san, he is actually appearing on the right uh, top corner, the, the corner. Or maybe, maybe left, chef, I don't know. Maybe uh, one of be. the Michelin. Yeah, uh, yeah so yeah. He, Nakahigashi. And then uh, we had a very good uh, discussion about, you know, uh, vegetarianism and so on and so forth, because, you know, that kind of um, is uh, um, what, you know, um, related to the comment. You know, he is a chef and then... Um, his uh, restaurant's name is to uh, Sojiki Nakahigashi So, so that is uh, the um, grass eaters, you know, the restaurant. So his main thing is, uh, um, you know, um, uh, rice cooked in the uh, okudo-san, you know, um, in the traditional um, uh, way. But um, when we talk about, um, you know, um, shojin, he brought out this uh, good point about, you know, appreciating um, um, what we eat. So, I mean, uh, one of the philosophy about the shoujin cooking is to um, um, take in, uh, to use everything, like a skin and then um, skin of the vegetables and then also the roof or roof of the leaf of the daikon and everything. And then, you know, find a way to... Um, you know, cook it in a way so that entire vegetable get eaten. So uh, for Nakahigashi-san, he um, says that um, from the point of view to appreciate the life, um, because we have to sacrifice, you know, vegetables' life or animals' life mm -hmm. uh, to sustain our body and our life. So um, he said, um, isn't it um, the most important to be aware and then appreciate it fully. And then um, as a chef, you know, how he can bring the awareness and then how he can uh, find a way to uh, use it all. And then also, um, yeah, to share that, to, um, to let people know that, you know, we are consuming um, or we are taking in some uh, another life. Yeah, living. Yeah. yeah, the living life. So, um, yeah, so that was a... So in his restaurant, he um, his main thing is a vegetable, but he also uh, then, um, serves fish and then um, meat also, but uh, in the context of uh, taking in all, the, all life. So we thought that it was a really uh, good point, you know. So as we interview people, you know, that kind of question comes comes up. You know, of course, you know, there's a definition about shojin, what shojin is, and then um, Beant shares his, uh, you know, um, his uh, understanding of it. But also when we ask the question to uh, different people, you know, there's a different understanding of it. And then um, where um, each person emphasis, uh, put the emphasis. So uh, that's a very interesting part of it, uh, or, of our project. Yeah. Even if I may add uh, to that, even um, uh, Ishikawa Genbo uh, Sensei, the uh, mm -hmm. abbot, uh, made a point of, of exactly that, uh, that yes, generally understanding shojin is vegan, or at least vegetarian, according to the Buddhist uh, precepts, sort of in, to avoid killing. But uh, he, he explicitly pointed out, we also, when we eat a uh, carrot, that's also a living thing. So we shouldn't get too, uh, too much in that categorizing uh, vegan, vegetarian or not. That's also, to my mind, uh, not the key point, really. Um, the key point is appreciation and attention. Um, and if you do uh, pay attention, then automatically you will not be, uh, I mean, there's nothing, to my mind anyway, there's, there's nothing necessary totally against eating fish or meat. 
and maybe some people will not like to, or may not like mm -hmm. to hear that. But um, it's the point is to be attentive and to understand what one is doing, uh, not to to shovel in things mindlessly. That's the point. Mm -hmm. And um, I think if you have that approach to eating and cooking, uh, naturally you will. Uh, at least have um, have a focus point on vegetarian uh, diet because that's a natural thing, and um, and, I think, and uh, also the body doesn't need all all that meat yeah. to the contrary. I think uh, I think the big argument for me, and I I appreciate this kind of there is no black and white approach and the more people that you interview you hear the different perspective and the different reasons behind why some of these experts and insiders are doing it in a slightly less traditional way or a slightly different philosophy than maybe you were taught originally um, but I think it's very important in terms of sustainability to realize that eating meat or fish, maybe that's that's sustainable, but unlikely in this modern world. The way that fishing is done, the way that meat is raised for meat, animals are raised for meat, is not sustainable. And it's very damaging to not only the environment, it's very damaging to the people that have to work in the meat packing industry, to have to raise the animals, to have to kill the animals. These are all jobs given to people who have less equality in society. So it's it's really damaging to the environment. It's really damaging to people. It's, it's yeah. damaging to the people eating it. <laughs> yeah. such and then, degree. yeah, it's not, not healthy for you. Um, yeah. But I think that's easy to lose sight of, right? In terms of yeah. convenience, we have developed these very unhealthy, unsustainable situations for the meat and fishing industry in theory it doesn't need to be any less ethical but it is in actuality yeah. right yeah. Uh, yeah 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 and then even you know for the um last few months i mean um we have been um kind of um we got to know uh, the vegetable you know we uh, we started to um help um, the, uh, the farmer who lives uh, nearby. And then um, it brought us a great awareness how hard it is to, um, how, um, to grow uh, one carrot, for example, or any vegetable. And then how hard you know, uh, those farmers works. And then um, it just is uh, so amazing that, um, you know, for me, um, because I grew up in a suburb, um, and then I never uh, cultivated, you know, um, uh, my mom grew some vegetable in her garden, but um, not to the point that, you know, um, you know, um, that, you know, um, you could rely on. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, um, you know, we became right now we live um, very close to, um, you know, those vegetable gardens and farmers. And then we made friends with a few farmers. And then, you know, it's difficult. They have to be working, you know, um, every day in the field and they have to watch the, the weather and then uh, the, the changing of the climate is really affecting them. And then um, to eat, you know, uh, one um, that whatever the vegetables, one napa or anything, you know, if you see them working, you know, you know, you have no choice but appreciating it. And then, um, you know, of course, naturally, you would try to find a way to use all. So I, I think, um, to me, you know, I understood the philosophy of the shojin, but, you know, um, for the last uh, um, a year or so, uh, living in this environment, close to the farm, you know, to the farm and everything, so, and then uh, talking to them uh, brought us a uh, great awareness that, okay, it's not as a philosophy, but, you know, what it means to go local and what it means to um, be a, uh, right eating season and then uh, appreciating all and then think about the connection, you know, 
from the you know uh, the so, farm yeah to the soil to the our plate yeah and then you know making a loop wonderful so, I, yeah. I love that we did a workshop uh, with kaiseki vegan kaiseki diori from a mm -hmm. ryokan chef and it was my first time to ever shop for such extremely seasonal ingredients like I think as as most cooks or many moms who cook every day you get in the habit of just making spaghetti every day or just making udon every day with the same ingredients no matter what time of year it is so we were using, and I see in your beautiful photos of your food burn, beautiful seasonal like herbs or the top of flowers or things that you do not normally buy. And, but if you seek them out in Japan, you can still find them even in supermarkets. It just amazed me that it is actually accessible if you seek it out, right? Yeah. Amazing. So that is something very unique about Japan that we still have access to these extremely seasonal things if we look for them, if we know what to look for. Yeah. And that's that's maybe in, in Kyoto especially so. And uh, mm -hmm. since we are on the sort of out, I mean, still central Kyoto, but on the outer skirt of the city itself, um, there is, as Mitsu just mentioned, there are a lot of uh, farms and, and even rice fields uh, in walking distance. And uh, some of them are really dedicated to uh, also experiment with uh, old types of vegetables and organic farming and so on. So um, there, there is a lot of, uh, there is, a, I think, maybe even a renewed energy into that direction that people are also young people, luckily, uh, are aware of, uh, of the need uh, in, in this connection and, and uh, understand uh, simply the tastiness and how much richer um, the various types of carrots, for example, are. And in the supermarket, what you can buy there, it's basically, it's not only Japan, so, but anywhere in the world, uh, almost these days, it's like two, three types of carrots or of whatever and uh, but there are hundreds you see i mean it's uh, it, it's just and then even within uh, one type or one breed of, of carrots each one is different it's it's these are individuals really and um, the tendency for example what we see in the supermarket that they all look uniform they are selected to you look uniform is misleading they are not mm -hmm. and actually that's the beauty of them that they are not and um i think to rediscover i mean at least for people mm -hmm. like us growing up in in, uh, in, in cities um mm -hmm. is, uh, is 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 uh, mind opening really as an experience and uh and very very enriching um, and, and fun also. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think so. Uh, you you interviewed so many elderly people or people that are kind of at the end of their careers. You did send me one uh, photo of a young couple on the uh -huh. top top left. Can you yeah, introduce yeah. them? That's, oh, a, that's a young couple in Ohara, which is about, uh, I mean, from where we are, is, is mm. 10 minutes by, by car or bus. But uh, so it's a little bit north of, of Kyoto and famous actually for their vegetables. They have an old tradition of uh, um, very fertile grounds there and, and it's close enough to Kyoto. So they have centuries of traditions in, in growing uh, delicious vegetables and, um, and also shiso. They are especially uh, mm -hmm. famous for their akashiso, uh, which then um, is uh, one of the key ingredients for their tsukemono, which is, uh, uh, but many other things are being grown. And they grow, I mean, he basically, mm -hmm. like he's the one um, doing the field work. So he grows most of the vegetables and also rice. Do mm -hmm. I remember the that correctly? Too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then they have sort of a little Yado type, so it's, it's a restaurant, small restaurant, where they, they also live in that house. And uh, it's a sort of rustic, when one can see that in the background a little bit. Mm -hmm. 
um, very, very charming place. And uh, they serve basically, it's, it's literally farm to table, very, very close to each other. And um, and are in, and he especially is in a, in, a, in a or both of them in a constant learning process of what he likes to cook and it's like the long kind of circle and um, and he experiences a lot and is uh, it's, it's a lot of work He's very very dedicated. Mm. Um, but they keep it up, and we, we actually just saw them last week, and um, and it's a very um, honest approach to what they do. But one can also tell they have fun with it. It's 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 a fulfilling uh, type or way of life. One can almost say, mm. and um, and one can taste that. Yeah. Very delicious what they serve. That's amazing, and that's so important for sustainability. It has to be enjoyable. You yeah. can you can yeah. only gum on for so long, right? <laughs> so, you can only yeah. put up gum on or put up with it, as they say in Japanese. Um, you can only like do something unnatural and unsatisfying for only mm -hmm. a short time. You can't do it for a long time. Um, mm -hmm. I love this quote from the information you sent me, talking about shojin yori. And you say the meaning of shojin is its holistic, multi-dimensional approach based on de Zen Buddhist teachings and worldviews. It's transferable, boundless, anywhere, anytime, and to anyone under almost any given circumstance. I love that the far-reaching account, not account of the connectivity of shojin and the philosophy of shojin. And uh, yeah, we only have a few more minutes, but I'd love for you to comment a bit more on that. I love that idea that it can be applied almost anywhere, almost any time by anyone. Yeah, yeah, it, that's just the case. Uh, it's, uh, I think some people may have uh, a, a uh, perception uh, of shojin or also other, other things, but to, to, uh, to focus on shojin is something exotic and difficult to do and it's so refined and as we touched on earlier uh takes years to study and so on and so forth it's all true but it doesn't mean that you can't start you know and and you will have immediate uh um, results which are very very satisfying and uh, it really does not matter if you have access to this or that ingredient doesn't matter whatsoever. It's it's really it's a mindset, and the, the approach, the way uh, how you how you approach the whole theme, and uh, you know however the circumstances, our minds are free, and we can we can do that. And if if uh, if you know there's not even a daring aspect to it. It's just mm -hmm. to jump over that maybe. Um, uh, seemingly uh, difficult thing to do. Yes, it is difficult, but anyways, uh, start and uh, and it, it's immediate, uh, immediately rewarding, uh, and, and everyone can experience that uh, immediately. So that's I think. I mean, let's give them this food <clears throat> more so than anything else. I think. I mean, if you start. Uh, say, shodo or something like that, you know, calligraphy. You really, and before you can manage or play shakuhachi or something like that, you need a substantial amount of time to even get out one tone, which is sort of decent, or one stroke, which is sort of powerful. But with food, um, you know, it's the immediate experience of eating something delicious. Um, and... Sure, everyone can do that. Everyone can experience that. With the most simplest of local ingredients, whatever you find at, at your markets, uh, uh, or if you're lucky enough to have your own garden or fields, then even better. Um, and um, if you put care to it, then it will turn out nice and delicious and good. And you will feel that. So, And that's the starting point, I think. And then, yes, it's endless, but, you know, it's endlessly fun and endlessly good. So mm. why not? Mm. I, I was talking to bakers and chefs in the series 
And they always talk about uh, you have to love what you're doing at the time because if you make something and you're in a bad mood, your customer is not going to enjoy it. And I'm, I'm sure you, you feel the same way with shojin. You really have to be in the right mindset as you're cooking it in order for your customer to appreciate the proper feeling that you had when you made it. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and that uh, sort of maybe relates also to what what we talked about earlier on. That uh, for me, the degree of dedication uh, was always so impressive when I worked in those kitchens, and uh, it was not only um, maybe some some people may have that image of these stern, hardworking, uh, and and there are people like that, of course. But to me, the combination out of um, dedication and a uh, jolliness, really, of, of uh, you know how with how much fun people worked, and they were you know 12, 14 hours or something. That's not unusual in kitchens, and uh, but uh, happily so, and that surely transmits into the short and into the food. There's no question in my mind, and yeah, you know, one can taste that. Right? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. Well, that that is our hour. I'm afraid I could talk to you about your amazing food and beautiful photography all day. You two are to- so talented, and I'm I'm so glad that you're working on this amazing project. And I am sure there is going to be wide-reaching effects of an audience on many different levels, like you said the philosophical level, not only about foodies in particular, but a more general sustainable living, sustainable lifestyle um, audience there that I, I'm really excited for what's going to come. You don't know it's a book, if it's a movie, or it's both perhaps, or podcasts. Yeah, very exciting. So, so are we. Yeah. yeah, best of luck. Keep it Thank up. You. Please don't yeah. stop. <laughs> yeah thank you thank yeah. you very much yeah and it was a joy as always wonderful <laughs> thank you so much and thank you everybody for joining today and for your wonderful comments which some of them I couldn't add but I put them down below thank you so much for commenting tomorrow morning we have a talk with Stephen from uh, about travel Japan travel tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. and then on Wednesday we're talking with an organic farmer in Kagoshima she runs Kansha Farm in Kagoshima. And uh, on Thursday as well, we're talking about culture and travel with Brigitte. So please join us again. Thank you so much. Everybody take care. Have a wonderful day. See you later. Thank you, Bern. Thank you, Mitsui. Thank you. Thank you, Joy. Bye. <laughs> Thank you. Thank Bye. You. Bye.